Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here at the RSA Conference 2023 live coverage, CUBE, fourth day, wrapping things down. Man, wall-to-wall -wall content, 45,000 people. It's not letting up. Even the last day, you'd think it'd be kind of a lag, people kind of straight. Well, yeah, people are leaving to go to the airport, but still, a lot of people. I'm John Furrier, your host. Dave Vellante left the building. He's on his way home to Boston. As we wrap up uh, RSA, we're going to take a look back at the event, but also get some real solid commentary from a CUBE alumni, Bruno Kurtik, founding chief strategy officer at Sumo Logic. Bruno, thanks for coming on, appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. So, appreciate you coming on, and I know you've been super busy because you've been <laughs> it's a hot show, and there's lunches, there's dinner, five dinners, five cocktail parties, and then next thing you know it's 11.30 and you're hitting the pillow, or yeah. maybe later. Um, what are you seeing here at, at, uh, at the event here, RSA? Large numbers, events are back, that's a steady state from like 2013, 2018. What yeah. are you seeing? Uh, we're so we're seeing sort of a coming back together, like the energy is back in the show. It used to be, you know, the last three years were hard and, and being back here and feeling the energy of, of, of people kind of packing together, talking and collaborating and discussing, uh, that, first of all, that's great. Second, we have lots of customer conversations uh, people are very much still keeping security top of mind. Um, we're seeing a lot of sort of intrigue and, 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 and thinking about how do we start applying some of these new technologies like uh, uh, AI and ML even further now that we've had the resurgence of AI uh, mm -hmm. in the last few months. Uh, <laughs> that's becoming you know, sort of at the hype cycle top of mind for people, and, but it is real, right? A lot of um, progress has been made and these are legitimate questions that we need to think about how this apply to all of us in the industry over the next two to five years. Yeah, I mean, Dave, Dave Vellante and I would joke, it was just invented over the holidays. <laughs> and he picks up in January, but, but I think, again, chat GPT, open AI, I think, yeah. opens up the world to see what the insiders have known for a long time. Yeah. Machine learning's been booming, AI's right around the corner. I think the chatbot market was terrible up until this point, but I think it opens up like, wow, that's magic. And that gives people a taste of horizontally scalable it is from a use case standpoint. Like, it impacts everybody. I've had people that aren't in tech saying, oh, I can see how magical this is for my life. Yeah. So I think it captures the attention that's right. and ups the awareness of, okay, next gen is here. Yeah. And, cool. and I think that to me is the big, and I wrote a story about this and it kind of didn't get a lot of play when I met with Adam Selesky at Amazon. I said, we're next gen cloud. He's like, no, they're ISVs. Said, no, we're the cloud. I'm like, okay, well, not really, you're the cloud, but yeah, everyone's on that. But when I build on top of the cloud, I can have an ecosystem without yeah. building the cloud. You built the cloud. Yeah. So what is an ISV? What's an ecosystem platform? So we're now in this whole nother next gen where the AI is like, wait, if that's going to happen, I can see things being thrown away or automated away with machine learning and do twice or 10x the performance, yeah. almost in all categories. Yeah. There's a lot of toil that these tools can take away. And it's interesting, I think the, the chat uh, incarnation of this technology was a brilliant marketing ploy to bring the masses to understand the, the possibilities. Like, these language models have been around being trained. I mean, ChatGPT finished training on up to 2020 data, right? So, like, this has been going on for a while, but the general person could not grok what it actually means. And I think it was a really interesting way to showcase the power, yeah. and now we can move forward and see how we can apply it properly. Well, I personally love it. Dave and I were also loving this because it brings back a renaissance of how we first met you guys at Sumo Logic, going back to the big data days. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> prehistoric days when there were animals on Earth roaming. <laughs> 2010 is called Hadoop. Um, it didn't have, the pro uh, the promise was there, and then it just was hard, and then obviously, so it happened there, you got data, data bricks came along, Snowflake, mm -hmm. Amazon Cloud grew, Hadoop yep. kind of fell away, it's hard to use, but we were kind of on the right track, and then what ended up happening was being a data first. So now, it, the AI is data driven, yep. very key part. How do you see cloud scale, distributed computing, and now AI, machine learning, changing the architecture of what customers might put together, knowing that there's going to be significant performances in, in reducing toil or mechanisms that accomplish the job yeah. that aren't needed, could impact labor, could impact machines. What's your take on the yeah. impact of architecture? That's a great question. In fact, it's, it's, so these three levers were kind of the architecture, the, the, the cloud, cloud and, and the size of data and the, and the machine learning AI has been sort of part of what we founded the company around. The challenge that I see with you know, you can build an architecture that scales with data 
to be able to sort of cope with the exponential growth of data, right? So we can capture more data and more data and more data, but human on the other end of that data, on the other end of the keyboard, is always going to be a harder and harder time to capitalize on what that data is telling him or her, right? You need to mine it for insights, and this is where, in order to bend that curve of exponential growth, this is where AI and ML are, cri ML are critical, right? And so, now it's all coming together. Right? We've got cloud that allows us to scale, deploy new microservices, scalable architectures, we've got growth in data, and we've got AI and ML that can be combined into something that can potentially keep, keep pace with the growth in data productively, finding the right insights, finding the right challenges, issues, breaches, whatever it might be, and helping the human be more effective at the job. Yeah, and that, the, that flip, that script has flipped. You guys are successful because of it, yep. because you can't scale the, the amount of data coming in with humans. That's but right. humans can have an influence on the machines as augmentation to scale. That's, right. That's kind of, everyone kind of gets that. Well, I think everyone gets that. They should get that. But now, now the next question is, okay, I want to program with the data. Now, I think what, what I think I see with ChatGPT and these kinds of new things where a prompt into a data set is like a query, so that could be like a SQL query, mm -hmm. or you could look at it as a procedure call. Yeah. Right, so it's almost like prompt engineering is a call to, to some other thing, yep. and then you got operationalizing it, prompt operations, some people are saying. Yep. Now the new thing is prompt tuning, mm -hmm. where it's now tuning itself yep. based upon the learning. The inputs and the This learning. is like the old self-healing, remember those mm -hmm. days? Yep. Now it's possible, so if you, if you believe that to be true, that means developers going to code on data. So the question that we were asking at KubeCon, I'd love to get your reaction is, developers actually don't make the decision on where to store the data. What if they could flip that script? What if developers can determine where the data is stored to maximize their programmability of it? Because if, if prompting is a call, that's a code. Mm -hmm. Then developers might be coding data a little bit of out there yeah. concept. What's your reaction to that? It's interesting because, you know, in part I think this, the whole sort of convergence towards platforms in the sort of DevOps and SecOps space, I think is in part going to help that become a reality because, uh, you know, in the sort of old worlds of best of breed tools, sp tools sprawl all over the place, you know, each tool needed its own data, needed access to it, so there was fragmentation and silos. And now, as, as we are starting to learn, that putting bits of disparate data together and mining it for insights and analysis is actually in part forcing this platform convergence and you know, developers will now have a choice of how to store that data and also through APIs and various access will be able to reach into all of their data through APIs yeah. with easy access. So yeah. I think yeah. that's going to drive a lot more as you call it, data programmability, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's again, it's an open question. It's just trying to put yeah. a frame around, understand it. The other thing that's come up at, uh, in the open source community is obviously open source is scaling, and I won't go into my code pollution mm -hmm. rant about how auto dri driving code in will cause more problems than it will gain, but I will bring up one, one trend in the CNCF, which is uh, WASM or WebAssembly, mm -hmm. which is something that should have been done years ago. Get a binary and have it work on every single, why rewrite yeah. code yeah. to do something? So that's a concept of productivity that's, that's so obvious mm -hmm. that's now happening. But if you go to the AI side of the tool chains, you can have an open data lake, but then a proprietary tool chain, is that a feature or a bug? But then that, that comes back to saying, if I want to run Snowflake and I want to run Databricks and, on Azure, like, now we're in this mode of, I'm a developer, that's not going to really kind of work for me. Yeah. So now we're kind of <laughs> going down that next level of iteration of, if data becomes programmable and you see the scale, the success of Databricks, the success of you guys, success of Snowflake, this data is going to have to be programmable, has to be accessible. I don't know how to think about it, that's why I'm asking the question, how do you see this evolving? Is it just natural evolution? Will that be a standardization model? Yeah. What's, your, what's, your re what's your take uh, on that? If you rewind a few years back, um, there was a lot more sort of black box AI, uh, ML mm -hmm. implementations, but like if you look at today, the open source technologies, uh, cloud native technologies, um, TensorFlow and others, are sort of cracking, o cracking open those black boxes, and even the black boxes are now getting built on these open standard ways of, of, of building algorithms and all of that. And so I think the, the general democratization of, of algorithms is going to continue. Um, but I do think that forever there's going to be 
proprietary algorithms. People are going to try to monetize on it. You yeah. know, companies exist to build, you know, and yeah. eventually those things will yeah. shed back into open source <laughs> and things like that. But so I don't know that it's going to change yeah. much, but I do think that there are many more open source, both tools and uh, practices that are available yeah. to developers to. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dave and I were talking, we think the data, and like we have a lot of language data on our side. Every Cube Interviews Index, yeah. over 35,000 interviews we've done. Uh, over 13 years, there's a lot of language, mm -hmm. li jargon, it's, yeah. it's language, it's mm -hmm. legit, tied to video and audio. And so we're thinking, well, okay, we're not going to build a, an open AI, we're not, uh, we're, we're not mm -hmm. going to be a query, although yeah. we do have a prototype up and running, but we're trying to think, okay, our value is our data. Mm -hmm. But if I take an interview snippet of, say, a sound bite of what you say, mm -hmm. and I pump it in a chat GPT, it'll write a blog post for me yeah. from your pure right. data. Yep. So data seems to be the proprietary or, not, it could be open, but the way to differentiate mm -hmm. versus giving everything to the LLM. Yeah, and if you think about that, like if I look at our own space, right? Um, we sit on, a, on on ocean of data, like not in a lake, it's an yeah, ocean it's of data. And the data that we process is very special, specialized. So it's technically pretty trainable on, right? You can take a model um, yeah. that has been pre-trained on language and then tune it and train it on specific things that where the, the model might be able to recognize what incidents mean, how to remediate, what next steps might be, how to, how to create a playbook and things like that. So that's, there's an opportunity, especially for people who are sitting on large amounts of data and are not sitting on silos of data to leverage these technologies to tune and train the algorithms on very special use case specific arenas and I think in security at RSA over the next couple of years, I, I expect to see a lot of that work starting to show up, companies starting to talk about, we certainly are thinking yeah. about that, yeah. right? And you know, because it's an opportunity for us to do better for yeah. the human. And that proves my thesis stuff. of the more data you have, the more observation space you have, the more data that can be put into yep. training to actually be used for something else. Yep. It's input to a function. That's right, and what you said, you said data is proprietary, or data is, data is the key, right? We happen to sit on a yeah. piece of data, a large amounts of it that most people don't, right? So we have an opportunity yeah. Yeah. to actually leverage the data and make it into a product. You know, that's one of the things that Dave and I thought was really wrong with the Hadoop world was that the people selling the mm -hmm. software didn't have the problem. They didn't have, they weren't data full. Yeah. They were just selling software. It was the big hyperscales that had all the data. Yeah. You have that's tons right. of data with your, with your customers and that's cool too. So that's a value for you. Now, the benefit to you guys is that there's now new opportunities. So what are those conversations that you're having here at RSA with customers? What are they, I mean, take me through the kind of the early elementary conversations and more progressed conversations. Take us through what are, you, what are those, what are you having with customers? What are they thinking about? Probably tire kicking, trying to learn to more advanced yeah. narratives. That's, that's a great question and, and we do, uh, our customer, if you looked at our customers set, you would find a lot of them sort of on the beginning of the curve learning yeah. curve, and let's talk talk about the curve of, of you know, going from you know, multi-tier apps to microservices apps, moving to the cloud, digitizing their business models and all of that. Yeah. And, and that spectrum of customers is really here to learn how, what's the, what's the right operating model in the, in the cloud? If I move to the cloud, how am I going to secure my environment? Who's going to control it? You know, developers are already out there. You know, how do I, you know, quote unquote control, <laughs> you know, how do I integrate, all yeah. of that stuff, like the, the, all of that, and a lot of those are good questions and also the wrong questions, as we've learned over the last 15 years, that when you go through cloud, it's a very different model, right? And so, and then we've got a lot of customers who are way down that, that, that curve, learning curve, who are in the sort of the most advanced sort of stages of, of really converging their observability and security processes they are, they are fully, when a security incident occurs, the security teams 100% collaborates with the development teams because the security team knows the security, developers know the code and the architecture, and, and it, you cannot solve incidents without those. And so, not only that, they're also asking questions about how do yeah. you reduce the cost because the, there's massive data overlap between security and observability, in, particularly in the cloud. So, we're essentially having that full conversation from what do you guys do, what's multi-tenancy in the cloud, to like how do I hyper-optimize how my teams shave 10 seconds out of an incident that's costing me you know, tens of thousands of dollars per second, right? Yeah. And so it's really interesting to sort of be context switching between those. 
You're going to see mm -hmm. massive innovations from, from that. You're going to see customers move faster mm -hmm. on identifying known things, yep. but also using the telemetry data to see other things. That's just fascinating. And we're, right. we're already seeing, you know, hey, and in the APM world of observability, while you're looking at transactions, well, would it be useful to start monitoring behavior of those transactions from the security perspective? Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, we've always seen this, this addressability of data needs to be available. Yeah. And so, how do you balance the siloed protection with making it available because there are decisions being made are based on what the data is available, and if the data yeah. is not available, it can't reason what it can't see. Right. So, how do you guys think about that with customers? Because it's a hard, thing to solve because now you're making it accessible. Mm -hmm. How, is there a new security protocol that comes out of this? Is it a, I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around what that looks like. How do you get the best of the data yeah. without, that's why I'm on this whole developer coding yeah. data. How, yeah. how does that work? Uh, it, it's tricky. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have the, 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 the full answer for you here, but like we deal with that day to day. We have very sensitive, you know, because we're a platform now, right? And we've got yeah. use cases all the way from development use cases to compliance use cases. And if you look at this data across the spectrum, you will see that you know, certain countries, certain regional, yeah. certain uh, um, vertical regulatory yeah. rules affect who can touch what, who yeah. can see what. And since the data is now in a single pool, how do you mm -hmm. govern access to it? How do you make yeah. sure that you can productively give data to people who can make benefit out of it? And so right now, <laughs> all of that is about you know, general governing access, monitoring access, yeah. auditing everything, and, and you know, Bruno, yeah. I will say that to end the, the week out here, it's great to have you on because uh, provocative conversation, but also relevant. If you look at the shows that are converging, we just came back from Mobile World Congress. That's a DevOps show now. We're here at hmm. RSA. This yeah. is basically a DevOps show. Yeah. So I mean, look, I mean, what we're just talking about. This yeah. is not security. This is like right. this devs, developers, mm -hmm. and ops. Yeah. Now you can say network ops or whatever, but that's just DevOps. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, this is cloud. That is how it is in the cloud. This exactly. is the top story mm -hmm. here at RSA. Yeah. Do you think you agree? I totally agree. All right, cool. That, is, that has been <laughs> what we've seen and what we've hoped would ultimately happen. Yeah, and I yeah. think you're right. It's going to be very interesting to see who can adopt and align after all. I mean, it is, this is not the oldest show. Supercomputing actually started in 1998, which we are now covering again because the chip side of the business is booming as well. Yeah, so yeah. you got silicon, Supercomputing, high mm -hmm. performance, used to be HPC, now it's yeah. more silicon advances, which is GPUs and more AI, all great stuff there. This show here, telecom, and then the cloud show's kind of coming together. This is the, like a, probably the biggest convergence I've seen in my history, 30 years in this business, yeah. where this much force is intersecting. Yep. And the data is the wild card, because data never has been a real lever in any kind of major inflection point. Yep. So That's true. It's, That's it true. Totally reality. agree. Final question: How's business with you guys? What's going on? Give it, put a plug into the company for Sumo Logic. Real business is great. You know, we uh, we we keep adding new products. We had a, some great announcements. We've added our SOAR capabilities to our product, integrated fully in. We actually integrated the Chat GPT into our security yeah. orchestration automation response yeah. pipeline, so you can now actually leverage that technology as you're assessing incidents and, and threats. Uh, we added UEVA to our technology stack. We're really excited, our customers love it. Uh, they've been asking for it for, for some time now and we have, we're having great traction and great conversations. Final, final question. As a strategy, founding chief strategy officer, what strategy changes or tweaks or adjustments are made based upon the new revelation to the role of the rest of the world and the, the, the geeks and the nerds out there that ML and AI is here to stay and is going to be enabler of new use cases or unknown big use cases. What's the strategy of Pasumo Logic? Great question. We actually started working on this strategy <laughs> more than a couple of years ago, and in fact, very recently, we, we put out uh, a model for our customers to, to be able to, to inline inside Sumo, inline with Sumo execution, actually execute their own ML and AI algorithms if they choose to do so. so using data science, they can be simple, complicated, to detect fraud and other things. So we're enabling our customers to put in their own code in line with our engine. Yeah. Enabling, democratization, open, yep. value-oriented. We call stuff. it open analytics. Bruno Kirkty, founding chief strategy officer here in, our, in the Cube's last segment. Four days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. 
Dave Vellante left the building. We recorded our podcast here, episode nine, on location. I'm John Furrier, host group. Thanks for watching this CUBE's presentation of RSA live coverage 2023. Thanks for watching.